The path to net zero begins right under your feet with radiant systems. The buildings we live and work in account for about 40% of U.S. energy consumption. So it's no surprise that getting a building to net zero energy can be a daunting task, especially if a high level of thermal comfort is also desired. That's why radiant heating and cooling systems are increasingly incorporated into high performance buildings. In the next few minutes, we'll discuss the heat transfer principles behind radiant systems and take a closer look at how they contribute to superior energy efficiency. A recent study by the New Buildings Institute found that about 30% of near net zero buildings in the U.S. use radiant heating and cooling systems. And when we focus on net zero energy buildings, they found that about half use radiant heating and cooling to meet some very impressive performance goals. Taking a step back, let's make sure we're on the same page about how a hydronic in-slab radiant system works. A radiant system is a network of cross-link polyethylene, or PECs, pipes that circulate heated or cooled fluid through a concrete slab to condition a space. In this picture, the PEC circuits are the red pipes affixed to the rebar. Warm or cool fluid travels through the circuits controlled by a manifold, which consists of supply and return header pipes mounted together as shown. The manifold is connected to the building's hydronic distribution system and is fed by any source of hydronic heating or cooling, from boilers to solar water heaters or ground source heat pumps. It is worthwhile to note that radiant technology and PEX pipe are not only used inside buildings, which is the focus of this webinar, but also in outside applications such as snow and ice melting systems or in turf conditioning systems designed for sports fields. While we're all pretty familiar with conduction and convection, radiation tends to be the most elusive heat transfer method. The basic physical phenomenon is that whenever there is a temperature difference between two objects, both objects try to equalize the temperature by exchanging energy through infrared waves. These waves are emitted by the warmer source and absorbed by the cooler surface, without actually heating the space in between. This picture of a man facing the sun is a great example of radiant heat transfer. The relatively cooler surface of the man is being warmed by the radiant energy emitted by the hot sun. We can translate this same phenomenon into the built environment by looking at a radiant heating slab. The diagram here shows a heated concrete slab. Heat is conducted from the warm fluid circulating through the pipes to the surface and radiates to the space itself. The infrared heat goes out to the walls, the furniture, the occupants, warming the space. Some warm air also rises through natural convection. Cooling doesn't need to be much more complex than the reverse of this. Rather than emitting heat into the space, the cooled slab absorbs heat from the space instantaneously, carrying it out via the fluid that's running through the same PEX pipes used in heating mode. Radiant is not limited to floor applications. Using the ceiling can be particularly advantageous for cooling because warm air rises to the cooled surface. This convection output complements the radiant heat transfer, increasing the system's capacity. There are several reasons why hydronic systems using radiant heating and cooling can save energy when conditioning a space. Physically speaking, the specific heat of water is much greater than the specific heat of air. The same amount of heat can be transferred through a 3 quarter inch water pipe as through a 14 by 10 inch air duct. In practice, what this means is that the same amount of heat can be moved with a hydronic system as with an air distribution fan. But the fan's AC motor draws 75 to 90 percent more energy. While radiant heat transfer is very efficient, both air-based systems and radiant heating and cooling have important roles to play in the built environment. The most effective systems use a hybrid of radiant and forced air. We can demonstrate this concept using an Energy Plus simulation of an office space. ASHRAE 62.1 calls for a certain number of air changes to handle fresh air requirements, but we also need a portion to support the conditioning load during the peak hours of the year. If we have a 100% forced air system, then we're going to need 7.5 air changes to meet these loads. This equates to about 400 CFM of air coming into the space. If we go with a hybrid radiant and forced air system, we're able to decrease the air change rate to 5, primarily serving the ventilation schedule, with a small portion needed to handle the latent and remaining sensible cooling. The office's air requirement is reduced by 45% to just 268 CFM, allowing air handling equipment to be downsized. By integrating Radiant, we also impact the occupant's experience of thermal comfort, allowing us to design with more moderate air set point temperatures. This graph shows air temperature, what we see on a thermostat, on the y-axis and mean radiant temperature, the average temperature of all the surfaces on the space on the x-axis. The pink band is an approximate comfort zone. 
When incorporating radiant cooling into space design, we are directly altering the mean radiant temperature, shifting us to the left on the graph. In order to stay within the comfort zone, we can then alleviate the air temperature. Instead of designing for the typical set point of an air-based cooling system, which may be as low as 72 degrees Fahrenheit or even 70 degrees, we can set the air temperature at 75 to 78 degrees because our surrounding surfaces have been effectively cooled by the radiant side. Likewise, as we increase the mean radiant temperature through the warmed slab, we can decrease the air temperature to about 68 degrees. Beyond comfort, there are obvious energy implications of setting your thermostat to more moderate temperatures. Not only are there instant savings in reduced heating and cooling loads and operating costs, there's also potential to reduce the size of air handling equipment since the air side can be designed for a reduced load. As we look more closely at the Energy Plus model of a hybrid radiant system compared with a 100% forced air system, the overall energy analysis looks very favorable. In this model, the hybrid system reduces total HVAC energy consumption by about 30%. The added components of the radiant system consume very little energy compared to the amount that they are able to save. Clearly, it is time to challenge our assumptions about sizing air handling equipment, opening possibilities for more usable space, quieter environments, and reduced initial investment costs. In addition to saving energy, Heating and cooling systems that use moderate water temperatures pave the way for integrating geothermal energy. The New Buildings Institute study I mentioned at the start of this webinar notes that the radiant systems in net zero energy buildings are often integrated with ground source heat pumps for maximum efficiency. A forced air fan coil might require temperatures at the extreme ranges of a ground source heat pump. The wonderful thing about pairing radiant with geothermal is that because we run at very moderate supply fluid temperatures, typically 100 to 120 degrees in heating mode and 55 to 60 in cooling mode, we are operating in some of the highest coefficients of performance for the geothermal equipment. This added optimization makes an already low energy system work at unprecedented levels of efficiency. A good example of this is found at the YWCA Elm Center in Toronto, Ontario, where a radiant in-slab heating and cooling system was paired with geothermal. The outcome was about 45% energy savings over conventional mechanical systems. With these savings, we can easily see that technologies like radiant and geothermal, especially when used together in a holistic design, are some of the key steps you'll want to take on your path to net zero buildings. This concludes today's topic. Like you, we're always learning more about how to apply radiant technologies in high-performance buildings. To continue this dialogue, visit our Path to Net Zero webpage at www.na.rayhow.com slash netzero to read case studies or sign up for our mailing list so you won't miss our future webinars. Whether the goal of your next project is net zero, near net zero, or just finding practical ways to reduce energy consumption, contact us. With a product range that includes high-performance systems for heating and cooling and the building envelope, Ray Howe is uniquely qualified to help your design team optimize building performance.